Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In a wooded area just outside of a housing complex for military residents and their families of Fort Polk near Leesville in Vernon Parish in Louisiana. I was in the woods walking around and turning to the deeper recesses of the forest. I saw a rather tall figure coming towards me on two legs. It was hard to discern at first what its appearance was, but as it got closer, I noticed it was covered from head to toe with a thick coat of dark hair. Needless to say, I didn't stick around to find out what it wanted. I turned and ran until I got to the neighborhood and into the comforting environment of my house. I had heard no unusual sounds, as it is common with Bigfoot. When I did notice it, it was running towards me at a normal rate, but also at a constant rate despite the numerous amount of brush and trees in its path. It continued to run towards me until I had retreated from the forest. After I had left the area, I don't know if it had continued out of the woods, for I was already in my house. I was playing on this fallen tree, and earlier I had seen a family of possums. I just wish to say that this is not a prank story, and to the best of my knowledge, it happened. Like I said earlier, I was the only witness, and I was only five years old at the time. I hope you believe my story. I currently live in Virginia and have not been in that area for years, so I'm not sure if the area is the same as it was then. The area was a pretty dense forest that, of course, tapered as it came closer to the community. There was a stream where I was at, and I was playing on a fallen tree that created a bridge across the stream. Some sort of construction was being done off to the right, maybe another housing complex of some sort. On to the next one. One evening at Lake Vistanu outside of Shreveport, near a town called Corin, not far from Hughtown in Webster Parish in Louisiana. When I was about 13 or 14, my mother and I were inside our home. The time was probably close to dusk. There was still a little bit of daylight left. The next thing I remember was that my mother said that it was awful quiet outside all of a sudden. Then we heard the dog start howling and scratching to get into the house, which was remarkable in its own right because this dog was tied to a stake in the yard. This was a big German shepherd that had to be tied up because if he ran loose, he had a nasty habit of killing any animal he crossed paths with. Anyway, as soon as my mother opened the door to let the dog in, the dog literally knocked her over and went immediately into the bedroom under the bed. The door was still open, so I looked outside. This happened very fast. I noticed how dead, still, and quiet everything was. I felt that little charge of fear race up my spine, and I remember that the hairs were standing up on my arms and neck. And at that moment, my mother came back and started to shut the door when all of a sudden we both heard this scream. It was not human. It was not any animal I had ever heard. It was almost like a cross between a woman's scream and a cougar. Since I knew that there weren't any cougars or women standing out on our dock, we both knew we were hearing something unimaginable. We then heard big sloshes of water as if something great was passing through the lakefront. Our house was only about half of an acre up from the lake. This whole episode probably lasted only five minutes. We then noticed 
that the normal sounds of the swamp came back as if something had turned the lights back on. We knew that whatever it was continued down the lake. We heard from other families that lived along the lake that they had experienced the same thing. My mom and I noticed that it became very still and quiet outside, which is highly unsettling since we lived on a lakefront property. All you ever hear is frogs, crickets, bugs, alligators, raccoons, possum at all times of the day. My mother and I were inside the house. We both heard the dog scratching on the door to get inside. This was a huge German shepherd that was not afraid of anything. He was whining and shaking. The environment is a lake, very swamp-like in appearance. There are many cypress trees that cloak the edge of the lake, lots of moss hanging from them. Frog, snakes, insects, often alligators come up into our yard at night. On to the next one. My family and I have been experiencing Bigfoot visitation around our home on the Oregon coast. Instead of giving you all the experiences over the last nearly three years, I want to just share the one we first experienced. And even a visual our young children had one night looking out their window across the yard. That incident proved to us the existence and fact that Bigfoot is real. Here is the story of our experiences. We moved to this part of the Oregon coast from, well, not too far away, really. I had gotten a job in a town called Florence and relocated with my wife and our two kids, a boy and a girl. They were young when we moved here. Actually, he was six and she was four, and the only real solid sighting would come from them. My wife was, and still is today, a stay-at-home mom, one of the hardest jobs in the world, if you ask me. And after these little incidents, well, it just made things a little harder, I suppose. There have been plenty of odd moments, experiences, and of course, signs left behind from these creatures around our property. And yes, I said creatures, plural. The sighting I will explain to you by my kids was two Bigfoot, not just one. But as I was saying, we moved to Florence, not on the beach or near the dunes. Actually, the wife and I preferred trees to dunes. So we bought a house northeast of town near a large lake. Actually, we were a couple of miles back from the lake. The property sat off the main road about 50 to 60 yards back. The property itself was on five acres with a small three-bedroom, two-bathroom house and a small workshop off the side of the driveway. There were two trails that would lead one to the lake and the other to the creek. Personally, before everything started up, I had taken a walk down one of them one day and one to the lake. I met one of the very few neighbors about a mile in. He was a nice older man, around 75 if I had to guess, maybe a little older. He was kind, cordial, but a little weird to tell you the truth. And the oddest thing was the fact that he was walking with a baseball bat in hand. I did not ask, and he did not offer any reason for it. We introduced ourselves, chatted about the trail, how far away he lived, and exactly where, and that was it. Later, I would come to know why he had that bat, and why he was also armed with a gun I could not see at the time. So, here are a few of the major things we started noticing, and some of the experiences we had. We were about two months into living there, and really loving it. Actually, when the first of the weirdness would start to happen. And just so you know, while the weirdness still continues today, we are not scared of these things, but we are aware and do practice a great amount of caution. Besides, we think they are gone currently, but we are not sure. Maybe they do migrate from time to time. Either way, 
It has been over a month since we have heard or found anything. Anyway, it started with my wife. She was hearing screams one late afternoon or early evening. I was working late that day. I would not be home until after dark. It was actually getting dark by 5 p.m. at the time. My wife said she was out playing with the kids in the yard when she heard what she could only describe as screaming coming from the lake. Well, not the lake itself, but in that general direction. There were at least three to four screams she recalled. At first, she believed it to be that of a mountain lion nearby, but something about the screams as they came made her believe it was something else. By the third scream, it had moved closer to the house, still a pretty good distance off, but louder and closer nonetheless. At this point, she would hear one more before they stopped, and she said it sounded almost human, or human, period. It was guttural at first, and then grew into a wild-like, high-pitched scream of sorts. It was loud, even though you could tell it was still far off. Whatever was making that sound had to have some extremely large lung, she would say. She took the kids and went inside to their disappointment, of course, but she wanted to be safe. We had just moved here and things were still a little unfamiliar. The scream stopped for a few weeks, but eventually, one night, around 1 a.m. in the morning, I swear I was woken up to a scream off in the woods. But I did not hear it again when I was awake, so I gave it up to having a dream. When you have children, you do whatever you can to keep them safe. Eventually, when I would come to learn about something extremely scary they had experienced one night, well, a couple of times that we know of, we would start to consider moving away. But not to rush the experiences here, the next thing we actually started to find were literally snapped trees and footprints, not to mention I heard a grunt, a deep, scary grunt. I decided one morning to take a walk from the house to the lake. It would be a two-mile walk. The trail, for the most part, is flat, and almost a straight line from point A to point B, the lake. A few bends in the trail here and there, and a few little dips and hips, but nothing too rigorous for a guy that worked outside every day anyway. That first day, or short hike, was just me and my wife, actually. The grandparents drove over for the weekend and took the kids into Florence for the day. It was a great day, no clouds, I remember, and although my wife was a little nervous because of the screams she had heard a few times, by that point, she seemed to be okay and rather happy to get out on a walk with me. It was about a few hundred yards in when we noticed a couple of trees snapped off, about eight to nine feet up, the top part laid next to the trees, and I mean literally parallel to them. You could tell they were sat there purposely. I thought to myself that it was the older gentleman possibly out doing who knows what along the trail. However, as we walked on, there were more. Weird is what we thought. Why would he be cutting them off or snapping them off so high, and then stack or lay them next to the trees themselves? Good question, I thought. We walked on and made it to the lake. It was not a large lake, more like a really, really big pond to me. We sat for a few, had some water, and decided to just hang out for about 20 to 30 minutes, then walk back. After a few more minutes, my wife decided to take a walk along the lake's edge, and that is when we found our first Bigfoot print. Well, what we would come to know as real footprint from one or more of them. There were two, and she was really surprised, shocked, and I could tell after we examined them for a few moments that she was getting a little scared or nervous at least. They were large. 
I put my foot next to one and determined them to be at least 16 inches or a bit more in length. That caught me off guard, to tell you the truth. They were deep, and the toes could be made out clearly in one of them. Personally, I really was a little put off by the whole thing for a moment or two, but settling down into my right mind, I decided that they were either fake or they were regular footprints that just looked bigger because the person may have slid a bit into the mud as they walked along the edge of the lake as we did. Between the broken trees, the footprints, and the screams in the evening, we decided to get back before the sun descended any further. Besides, at that point, my wife was sold on what she thought was behind it all, Bigfoot. The whole way back, we did discuss it, and as a doting husband, I did take into consideration the possibility of such a creature, animal, or whatever people believe it to be could exist around here. The forest is thick here, and there is plenty of other predators that can live out here. So why not a Bigfoot? There was plenty to eat out here. I just hoped it was not us. The thought played in my head for a couple of weeks. Then it hit me like a bag of bricks what I heard from my son and daughter one afternoon. My kids were at that age that making up stories was, well, something they did not do really. You know what it is like. They tell the truth until they are teenagers. Ha. Huh. That is why I took them seriously. And besides, what I found in the yard that day and how serious they sounded at the time, well, two plus two does equal four, even if you do not like it. It was a few weeks after the hike over to the lake my wife and I took. As a matter of fact, it was a holiday weekend when we noticed fresh footprints along the edge of our yard and the woods. However, they had come close to the house, actually about 30 feet, feet from the south side of the house where the bedrooms were located. We have a little flower bed area covered in mulch bark, that light brown splintery stuff, you know? Well, there was a single impression or print right along the edge and just to the right in a small dirt and rock covered driveway that you could make out and the other foot impression from there we made a guess a correct one at that that whatever it was had come from the part of the yard basically in from the forest that is where we found a few footprints that seemed to head off into the woods while i continued looking at the footprint my wife decided to go get the phone and take a picture of them. They did not turn out all that well, but you can see something. Either way, it was just before she came back that I heard a very deep grunt from about 30 yards away at least. It did not sound like a bear or a cougar. Besides, cougars do not grunt really, at least not that I know of. After that, I thought I heard footsteps, bipedal steps, walking off into the distance. It was at that moment that I started to really think Bigfoot was real, and a few minutes later, I would believe it 100%. I told my wife what I heard, and she started feeling a little uncomfortable, being outside as it was getting late, and the sun was going down, throwing dark shadows across the yard. We sat finally, eating dinner with the kids. We started chatting about the possibilities and worries of a Bigfoot, or a couple of them hanging out around the property. The word ape and monkey came out of my mouth, and no sooner did I say that that my son said, and I quote, There were a couple of monkeys outside in the yard last night, Dad. Did you see them too? They are scary, but funny. My wife, she was now paler than our sheep, and my own heart fell to the floor. Moving was the first word out of our mouth, but at the same time, that was not possible. The kids, well, the oldest, my son, said that they were standing near the edge of the forest the night before, just out of direct light, except one decided to walk closer eventually, and he said it came from the opposite direction from where the one he was watching was standing at the time. So there were two of them. He mentioned this one had shown it he thought it was smiling at him, and he said he smiled back. 
It did not go past the flower bed, so at least it did not approach their window. I have heard stories of that, and it freaked me out to no end. The scariest part, we left their window slightly open the last few nights because it was warm outside and the cool night air felt good. But from then on, my wife made me shut it, lock it, and put sticks behind it. We were quite frightened, especially if these things were bearing teeth at my kids. Were they predators that ate people too? Or perhaps they ate other animals, but had a certain dislike for us that ended at that, just a dislike. I did not know, perhaps it was smiling, Either way, I was not wanting to find out. I just wanted to keep everyone safe. My son said they were really tall and covered in dark furry hair. They looked like apes or monkeys, he said, except they did not walk like monkeys. They walked like us. Oh, and the head he mentioned looked like the football his mom and I got for him for Christmas. Other than that, he only talked about them walking back and forth, showing teeth for a while, and then they were gone. I don't think kids his age are all that good at description, but that was enough to convince me that we were dealing with Bigfoot. For a few weeks after the kid's sighting, all was quiet on our western front, if you will. Of course, my wife started reporting more screams coming from the back side of the property over time. They sound scary, to tell you the truth. I heard them myself, but for some reason, I think they are for communication purposes. At least, that is what I make myself believe. I came home one night, pretty late actually. As I got out of the car, I heard some hollering not too far away. As I looked out toward the back of the property near the trail, I swear I saw a tree shaking or swaying violently. It was a full moon that night, not a cloud in the sky, so seeing the horizon and the tops of trees was easy. This one tree was moving back and forth rather quickly. Then it stopped, and so did the yelling. And yes, it was not a scream. It was more like yelling or hollering than a scream. It was after hearing my son talk about these things he observed that night, however, that prompted us to consider moving. But that was really out of the question, for now at least. And the fact we never had any day scary incidents well, the wife grew eyes on the back of her head, but she would play outside with the kids still. What could we do? And what my wife asked me to do was to get someone out there, a professional, if you will, about the subject. So, thanks for the referral. Our Bigfoot expert is really helping out. I know that these things are wild animals, so keeping a close eye when out and about around the property with the kids is a must. But I will say this. We must have come across the mild ones because so far, after a few years have passed, we have not seen them ourselves. Only a sign and noises have been observed. Oh, and no more sighting by our kids thus far since the one. As a matter of fact, for the last almost six months now, it has been quiet. So quiet, we think they may have moved on. But who knows? On to the next one. Rex and I had done this hike numerous times during different months of the year, each providing us with a different set of challenges. In particular, during the winter, the snow near the summit can be waist deep. Regardless of that, during any winter or even late spring hike, you will most definitely need walking poles and spikes. This is an extremely difficult hike in anyone's book, and I am sure many people turn back after having begun it. The left side of the trail can be quite treacherous, presenting you with many switchbacks and some very steep inclines where you are more mountain climbing than hiking. From Hoodsport, you head west nine miles on Lake Cushman Road until you reach Forest Service Road number 24. Turning left, you proceed three miles until you see the trailhead sign on your right. There are several things I will caution your listeners about. During this hike, you are virtually enclosed in forest the entire time, and on many occasions after you reach the summit, you will find that you are encased in fog, obscuring all of your views. From the top, 
you can see Mount Rainier, Adams, and St. Helens. Further off in the distance, you're looking at the Olympics. And below you is Lake Cushman, which is breathtaking in and of itself. There are also times of the year when the yellow jackets are swarming. There are so many of them that you can loudly hear them as you are approaching, and they will attack you. Now that I have thoroughly discouraged you, let me say that when things and conditions go right, this hike is one for the book. Well worth the effort. Although it is touted to be some 5.5 miles in length, on my GPS, I've clocked it at more or less 7.5 miles. I would also advise anyone to bring twice as much water as they think they will need. And if you have soft feet, bring band-aids as well. The last time that Billy and I were in here, we hiked up on a cougar that was less than 10 feet from the trail, and it took off like a rocket. This time around, we were planning to do our second night hike. There are absolutely no words to describe Sitting at the summit at 4 a.m. under the canopy of the night sky, I actually pity humanity for not experiencing such beauty in their lifetime. Rex and I were set to go, and it was about 1.15 a.m. when we began the hike. It was late July of 2010, and the night was pristine to say the least. Being well familiar with this trail, we had made it to the summit in about two and a half hours. I must warn you also that the hike begins at about 700 feet of elevation and at the peak you are at 4,300 feet. I only say that because this hike is steep and arduous the entire time that you are in it. Having achieved the summit, we laid back on our pack enveloped by the night sky. As I was laying there, I felt as though the sky was drawing me into itself and I was thinking that I was at one with the universe. Mere words cannot describe what we were feeling at the time. After about 90 minutes or so, we began our descent down the right-hand side of the mount. This side is somewhat easier than the left, and of course, we were now going downhill as well. I must say that for those of you who are not night owls, your eyes actually do get quite accustomed to the dark, and... You can see reasonably well, all things considered. On this trail, you are literally in the trees the entire time with only a few occasional breaks overlooking the slope and some well-dispersed living and dead timber. It was during one of these breaks that I was certain that I had seen something large and dark move quickly across a small clearing on the slope. The area it had moved across was maybe 30 or 40 feet away tops and it was very tall and large. We conversed briefly, kicking around as to what it could have been, and continued our hike. A few minutes later, both of us heard what was clearly some rocks and debris tumbling down the slope to our right. Now, understand me please, when you are in these conditions, hiking in the dark, your senses are most certainly heightened, and we began to feel like we were being stalked and or watched, and we were far from reaching the bottom. The difficulty became keeping our focus on the trail and our footing in the dark while still being acutely aware that something was definitely flanking our movement on the slope. We kept walking, all the while still hearing noises which were becoming increasingly unnerving to the two of us. At this point in time, we were not keeping silent and were actually shouting things like, go away, and trying to scare off whatever this was. We had just passed through a switchback that opens up into about a 150-foot, somewhat straight run of trail ahead of us when we both came to a sudden halt. Ahead of us, maybe 75 feet away, was a glaring pair of bright red eyes peering directly at us in the dark. These eyes were set very wide apart and were more than 10 feet from the ground. In the moment, I felt that they were almost having a hypnotic effect on me, but I tried to focus on the rest of the image that was before us. Even in the darkness, I could make out a clear outline of something 
of enormous stature that was rocking from side to side. As we were standing there looking at these eyes, Billy was standing slightly behind me on the trail. He bent down to grab a large rock and hurled it at this thing, hitting it squarely as he shouted, Get the heck out of here. Well, when I tell you that all hell broke loose, that would be an understatement. This thing let out a screaming roar that words can't describe. I thought it would knock us down, and it was deafening to our ears. The two of us turned simultaneously to run back up the trail. I don't think we were 30 feet into a retreat when I heard Rex let out a scream. I turned, and Rex was now on his back, lying on the ground, groaning as this beast was now standing over him, screaming with its mouth wide open and contorting its upper body. I was now maybe 10 feet away from an enormous, roaring Bigfoot standing over my best friend. In the heat of the moment, I guess I did what anyone would have done. I took one of my walking sticks, which were nothing more than winter ski poles with the rings removed, and I flung it at the beast, sidearm like a whirling sword. God was with us that day because it hit him squarely in the face. I believe it hit him right in the eye. I say that because the beast immediately put both of its hands to its face and started screaming, staggering around the trail. I now had Rex on the ground, reeling in pain, and a Bigfoot, staggering around, screaming. I don't think it was ten seconds later that the Bigfoot, while holding its hands to its face, lost its footing on the edge of the trail and fell off the side, tumbling down the slope. I knew I had to move, and move quickly, so I ran to Rex. As I tried to grab him, he said that his shoulder was broken. He couldn't move his arm, and he was in obvious pain. I told him, Brother, you have to get up, or this thing will kill us. We have got to move now. I pulled his pack off, got him to his feet, and we started moving downhill. Rex was writhing in pain, but he was moving, and this Bigfoot was screaming and howling on the side of the slope behind us. I think a combination of adrenaline and fear had taken over Rex because he was now moving quickly with my help. For some 15 minutes, we could still hear this beast groaning and screaming behind us in the moment. I could only think about David slaying Goliath in the biblical narrative with one smooth stone. Eventually, the sound of the beast were gone, and we covered a considerable distance. We reached a point where we could see the sun was beginning to rise, and all I could think of was that we were now safe. It's funny now, but in my mind, I actually thought of Dracula not being able to stand sunlight, and I was thinking the same thing about the Bigfoot. All that Billy has been telling you is exactly as it happened. We were now nearing the trailhead and the safety of our vehicle. When we finally got to the car, another vehicle was pulling over to begin the day's hike. When they saw us and the condition that I was in, they asked us what had happened. I needed medical attention, so we wasted no time. We told them that we had been attacked by a Bigfoot that was still up there somewhere and that we had hit him in the eye with a ski pole and ran. Their jaws dropped so far that they hit the ground. We jumped in the car and took off, and we could see them do the same. When we made it to the hospital, the doctor asked us what happened, and as you can imagine what that led to. After some x-rays were taken, we found that Rex had a fractured clavicle, which although it was quite painful, was not as bad as it could have been, and... After a sling was applied, he was feeling a lot better. When we were in the hospital, Rex told me that as soon as we had started to attempt running back up the trail, this creature had grabbed his backpack, slamming him to the rocky ground on his back. He knew immediately that something had broken in his body. Rex said that his body was shaking as this thing stood over him, roaring down at him. It was obviously retribution for being hit with the rock, and who knows, it may have killed both of us right there and then, even in the darkness, when we were finally all in close quarters, I could see the immensity of this beast. I thought I would collapse from fear alone, right on the spot, but something welled up within me, and I hurled the ski pole. 
I guess it was an all or nothing. And to be honest with you, I believe there was some divine intervention working for me with that keyhole flight that night. Because I firmly believe the pointed end went right into its eye. The way this thing was staggering and screaming, falling off the side of the slope he had to have had his eye knocked out. When I was on the ground and I looked up, seeing this thing leaning over me, I cannot tell you how frightened I was. Billy saved our lives that day, I am sure. If it wasn't for his quick thinking and reaction, I believe it would have killed us or maimed us both. I was 15 feet away from it when I let the pole fly, and it had to be 12 feet tall and as wide as a barn door. The sound of its roar actually made the skin on my face vibrate. It had to have weighed well over a thousand pounds or more, and that may well be an understatement. We have never gone back there again and wonder every day about those who do. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!